Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast. You know, I've been doing this now for three years. You think I'd get it right? I still have to read it. <clears throat> welcome to the next episode of the Shut Up and Do It podcast. Please, you can come hang out with us while we go through all things real estate and business with a focus on bringing you top quality speakers and topics, all who believe in a shut up and do it manner. I'm your host, Nick Allerud, host of the Shut Up and Do It podcast, creator of the REI Accelerated Platform and principal with AA Real Estate Buyers. Uh, we're an active buyer and educator in 10 markets across the country, based in greater Boston with a fix and flip, wholesale division, property management, short sale negotiation firm, and rental holdings company. Uh, and we function as an educator and networker to bring value for folks just like you who are beginning or scaling their real estate business. Today, uh, super, super fortunate to have a returning guest to the show. Uh, if you guys go back to episode 28 on shutupanddoitrealestate.com, you'll take a look at this gentleman, Mr. Darren Blomquist. He is um, the, uh, I call him the king statistician and king idea maker. However, he is uh, vice president of market economics at auction.com, uh, formerly of Realty Track and Adam Data. And uh, this gentleman has his finger on the pulse of all the craziness that went down. And I'll lead him in here, Darren. So back in 2019, it was October 2019, Darren and I finished off the episode chatting about how the prices could not keep going up and where we need a catalyst to bring this market into a correction that it would so direly needed. Darren, what the heck happened since 2019? Let's go. <laughs> well, we got, we got our catalyst, probably you know, not the one we wanted or expected, but that's the way these things work, right? You know, no, if, you, if, ever, if people knew what was coming, they, they wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't surprise <laughs> us and wouldn't cause the market to change. But yeah, we got a catalyst. However, the catalyst, what the, cat, you know, the catalyst did not cause a price correction. Um, I mean, maybe briefly for one second, the market thought about correcting. But, uh, and we did see, we did see home sales volume go down dramatically for a couple of months, but we never saw prices correct uh, or even, well, actually price, home price appreciation did slow down to the low single digits there for a couple of months early on in the pandemic. But then thanks to, I would say the response to the catalyst, which was the government response to the catalyst uh, of the pandemic, we saw the market go exactly the opposite way rather than correcting it uh it was uh it became a, a bigger bonfire than it already was and uh and so that's been the world that we've been living in and yeah i mean early on i was talking to investors using the auction.com platform to purchase properties we were trying to get a, a read on okay what are you thinking are you are you going to get scared off right at this point? And early on, some of them, yes, we're like, yeah, we're, this is a lot of uncertainty. We're going to pull back on buying for a little bit until we figure things out. But then a few months later, following up with those same folks, it was, oh, I wish I had, you know, I wish I had been purchasing more <laughs> or, you know, these properties that I bought right during in March, for instance, when, uh, when the pandemic hit March of 2020, I, you know, I, I, I flipped the property and made an extra $30,000 more than I thought I would have than because of this crazy market. So yeah, yeah, yeah I think, the I'm sure that you can <laughs> identify with that, but yeah, we saw, I would say it's, it was the response that the big driver of what we're seeing in the market today is not the pandemic itself. But the response to the pandemic. That's brilliant. To add to the, you know, what happened in March. So obviously I, I, we lived this, right? We had a whole bunch of active deals in the pipeline and we had a couple, even high end deals. One of them we did have to back out on. And for us, it, we, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you know what else we saw was a whole bunch of the um, small fix and flip lenders uh, and even peer, peer to peer lenders. So the, the people who, you know, you sell notes, uh, the crowdfunding sites, Mm -hmm. They all immediately backed up and dried off. They're like, nope, we're stopping funding. And I think that uh, was the source of so many funds for a lot of real estate investors across the country 
especially the ones backed by you know the California and New York firms, that uh, when they backed off, uh, literally they stopped lending. I remember uh, ninety per nine of our ten lenders at the time stopped lending for sixty days. Just said, I don't know what's going on. We're going to stop. And of course, 60 days later, they came back with a lot of modified you know, criteria as to what they would and wouldn't lend, which was extremely conservative. So I'm wondering if that fed into all the deals that just weren't purchased because the financing dried up, right? Wall Street was scared. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that was a big part of it. And, and that, was, that was one of the comments, at least from one of the investors I talked to is, yeah, we, I, I don't know if I'm going to have have capital and funding to purchase more deals right now because the mains he didn't name the name uh, but his main source of, of funding had had pulled back exactly like what you said and so certainly there was there was fear you know i mean another example of this is a little bit different was the the world of the i buyers the you know the offer pads and open doors of the world which in my mind maybe this is not politically correct to say this in front of a, investors, but they're kind of just a a, a new and not necessarily improved, but a different twist on the home flipping model. Um, anyway, they they definitely pulled back dramatically as well, and I think that had a lot to do with their capital sources getting scared of the market. And, uh, and so we saw that now on our platform, we saw, we saw the, the classic V shaped kind of like if you look at the overall retail market numbers, but literally just a couple of months, there was a drop off in demand for properties and then it just took off and our demand. I mean, the way that we, one of the key metrics we look at for demand is sales rate there are the two that we look at are sales rate and ex price execution. So sales rate is the percentage of properties that we have available that actually sell. Um, and then the uh, price execution is what, what they sell for relative to, uh, relative to the reserve that the lender has given us. And those numbers just jumped off, uh, jumped after a, a brief fall off a cliff, they, they skyrocketed, and uh, and and now some of that had to do with limited supply. So there was this foreclosure moratorium, and so the supply of foreclosures did not completely go away, but it was severely limited, and and so that had to do with it. But we just we saw the demand pick up. Just to give you an idea, the um, prior like back in October of two thousand nineteen when we were talking, we were seeing. Uh, at foreclosure auction, about roughly 38 percent, 38 to 40 percent of properties that went to foreclosure auction through our platform sold to third-party buyers. The rest of them went back to the bank, which actually was, we thought that was pretty good because the market average is more like 20 to 25 percent. Hmm. So because of what we were doing, we were getting more of them sold. But just in the last few months, that number has approached 70 percent. <laughs> uh, the foreclosure auctions are selling to third party buyers. And again, there's a lot fewer of them, but it just is a testament to how demand has, uh, for even these distressed properties has, uh, has jumped right back way and, above and, pre-pandemic levels. And that wouldn't be a function. The reserves are roughly the same, right? They, have, they haven't gone down, which is why they're all of a sudden spiking the 70% buyers, right? Reserves are the same. It's literally just, investment investor demand is is up yeah right the you know the the lenders have not capitulated on pricing they're not like in a down market the lenders might say well we're going to lower our reserves because we understand this market is is down but that has not happened <laughs> yeah and it's so that's and that's an important point the sales rate is going up and then this price execution is also going up both the price execution relative to the reserve, but also relative to the estimated market value of the property, which is, should be a more, uh, you know, apples to apples comparison over time. Both of those price executions are, have hit multi-year highs uh, during the pandemic. And so 
we're seeing tons of demand from <laughs> from home flippers and and other investors to to buy this product um, buy the you know the distressed properties that are on our platform would you would you know I, know I know you don't know the exact numbers but the rough breakout between brand new investors intermediate and experienced investors and institutional investors i don't know if do you know roughly who's buying most of it off the platform on our platform we actually did a survey and 87 percent of our buyers that at least that responded to the survey said that they were they were buying five or fewer properties a year there it is okay. so it's 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 definitely at least in terms of we def, uh, in terms of the number of buyers it's skewed toward the smaller what i would say the smaller investor um and in fact some of the institutional investors we do have institutional investors who use our platform and they buy a lot they can buy a lot of properties <laughs> and mm -hmm. so in terms of number of properties i don't know the statistic but even though I am a statistician king, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But you don't have to have one in your head. I don't, I don't know that one off the top of my head, but it would be, there's a smaller percentage of actual sales that go to the smaller buyers. But anyway, in talking to some of these institutional buyers just to get their read on, on things, they are actually being more cautious because, and they're kind of getting priced out by the smaller buyers. The smaller, like local investor, has been more willing to bid higher and so this institutional investor is saying yeah i'm not going to go that high because that doesn't fit my you know it doesn't fit what i need to do to to create a return for my <laughs> for my company and so they're um yeah they're pull, they're actually being more cautious right now than the smaller investor Gotcha. I'm going to go on a soapbox for a second and say COVID aside, which is hard to say, but back in the you know, market cycle, market cycles together, right? Top of a market cycle. I know when I've, we've had a top of a market cycle, when on our radio stations here, local in the Boston area, we hear this, like, we're looking for a few exclusive people in the Boston area to come to a hotel where we're going to teach you how to buy real estate with no cash or credit or experience. Come on in for $49 a head, right? And then they convince them to get into the mentorships and the guru camps. We see this tremendous spike in activity. Now, we're not on MLS. We don't operate on, with our, on market deals. We do use auction.com as one of our platforms, right? But it's so interesting. As soon as one of those seminars comes to town, like the national guys, everything spikes up for about six months and then settles back down when they're either occupied with their projects or a market turn happens and they're caught with their pants down, right? These these brand new investors at five or less, uh, they're watching HGTV. They're getting coached by these gurus that are getting lots and lots of money from coaching platforms and they don't have any stake in the deal. So they let them buy it. And as long as that market keeps going up and, and inventory is low and demand is up, right? There goes the prices, the, the market prices keep going up and up and up. So even if they screw up on contractor um, management, even if they screw up on purchasing it badly and poorly, and even if they go six months over, as long as that market's going up, all their mistakes are magically cured. And then they sell it for a profit, think they are amazing and a genius, and they try to do it again, which again, pushes a lot of intermediate, the guys who've seen the market cycle or institutional investors, right? They're pushing us kind of down and we're just kind of sitting on the back and the in the sidelines, like just waiting <laughs> to, until they all kind of, I don't want to say this, I'm just putting it out there because that's that's what we're seeing too. MLS, forget about it. And auction.com, I mean, the, we every time we hear one of those gurus come to town, it's like, bam, all the prices shoot up. And then we just sort of sit and wait and, and wait for the next round. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, for, from our perspective, it's a good problem to have because, you know, our, our clients are, are the lenders who are selling these properties like it when we, we get it sold for a higher price. That's but it. when you step back and look at the market perspective, it's like, well, yeah, is this, is this healthy? to see this this type of price appreciation that we're seeing i mean the price the price appreciation I, on these distressed properties that we sell on our platform is rivaling that of of the retail market in terms of the percentage gain so 
it's it seems like that's not uh, that's not going to be healthy or sustainable for the long term. Amen. Do you, do you happen to know roughly what that number might be? That appreciation number? Yeah, well, it was actually a few months ago that I looked at this, um, but it was well, it was about. If I remember right, it was like at uh, 16 or 17 percent appreciation, 16. whereas the nationwide number was more uh, was was more like eight to 10 appreciation. Now, since then, it's got the nation. The retail number has gone up to 23 percent appreciation. So I should now I want to look at this while we're talking to get you that number. But um, yeah, it's. Uh, we were we were outpacing price appreciation uh, in the in the retail market. It's so so crazy, and I think another huge element, like we talked about earlier, is the availability of financing. I mean, our our lenders that stopped completely for those sixty days when you guys saw the slowdown too, they came back with the modified criteria to be conservative, and then all of a sudden, when there was zero inventory, right? The all the at least the 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 fix and flip commercial lenders uh, immediately started making all their cash available to stupid LTV rates to at, at lower rate, lower pricing because money was everywhere and deals were nowhere. So they were trying to like, how much we have now we have capital again, who, who can find us deals? Um, and I think that, uh, right. That, that helped with all the activity, right. That pushes prices up when, when the capital is easily available. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. And, and, there's there's a lot of capital out there. It seems like looking for returns, uh, kind of you know, it was it, this was a trend we saw pre-pandemic, but it seems like it's accelerated during the pandemic. Um, and specifically in real estate, there's a lot of capital looking to real estate for for returns, and so that is is certainly helping to drive these prices up. And I you know I think along with uh, the i buyers, you have a host of other kind of companies that have have sprung up out of the the, the tech culture the i don't know what you want to call it dot com or <laughs> probably not dot com but the uh you know the the silicon valley culture or or they have some roots that are trying to reinvent real estate in one way or another mm -hmm. and those i you know that's bringing a lot of capital too and kind of models that are helping to push push prices up you know there's these i'm just thinking of models that for instance allow people to buy make a cash offer on a home and you know there's companies out there that will help you make a cash offer so you can compete with investors who are who are, are uh, who are using cash and but then basically after you've purchased the property, then you then you get your financing type of thing. So I think that that's another piece of this too, along with the kind of more traditional capital flowing to the market is you have these these new real estate models that are tackling different pieces of the real estate ecosystem and um, and trying to make things more efficient, but in doing so, I think that they they're helping to drive uh, drive prices up. Totally, yeah, interesting. But yeah, we'll see. There's probably going to be a lot of the tech shift left standing too at the end of this. But you will we'll see what it does to the marketplace. On the um, foreclosure moratorium, so if COVID happens. This foreclosure moratorium is put in place by the CDC and the federal government, and now, as you mentioned, August first, it's been lifted. What has the moratorium done to inventory to prices and then now what can do you think we can expect in the next six months one year and three years yeah well it's kind of created this artificial the moratorium has created this artificial scarcity of supply in the distressed market which does i think have a ripple effect on the over our real retail market and and so it's had an unintended consequence of of creating this this un, these unsustainable uh, price gains that we've just been talking about. Um, but we saw, uh, you know, we, we saw early on the foreclosure volume on our platform did drop 
to almost nothing. Um, it dropped just for like a month or two. Uh, it dropped to about 2% of pre pre-pandemic levels. <laughs> so basically a 98% drop in, in inventory. It has it been gradually recovered and is now been over the last few months has been we've been seeing the volume of foreclosures on our platform hovering around 25 to 30% of pre-pandemic volume. So in other words, um, 70 to 75% of um, pre-pandemic volume. And so, or below pre-pandemic volume, I should say. So um, the, uh, the numbers ha are still very low relative to the, the pandemic. And that's, that's caused this, this squeeze on, on investors. Um, but we do think that the moratorium is not going to open the floodgates suddenly. But we do have clients telling us that as of August 1st, they are going to start sending us some more inventory because basically what's happening is, well, the reason it went from 2% to 30% of pre-pandemic volume is that the biggest, the biggest kind of loophole in the moratorium was that vacant or abandoned properties could be still foreclosed on. So what we've seen is that the lenders got more comfortable with identifying properties as vacant or abandoned and going ahead and proceeding with the foreclosure process on those properties. Hmm. And now as the moratorium ends, what's happening is there's another government <laughs> policy that's kind of taking its place, which is the uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB, has put a rule that takes, that takes effect August 1st um, and, and affects all lenders. And it is, it's not a foreclosure moratorium, but it's, it, it puts on the lenders and servicers a lot of requirements to make sure that they are not foreclosing on anybody improperly or um, uh, anything like that. And so that rule has taken effect, but it does, in addition to the vacant and abandoned kind of loophole, it also has some additional loopholes. The biggest one being if someone was seriously delinquent on their mortgage prior to March 1st, 2020, which was pre pandemic, then that foreclosure can proceed. Um, assuming that person is not in forbearance, which is a different foreclosure protection piece that we could talk about if we want. But so there's, a, there's another loophole there. The other loophole that I've observed with the CFPB rule is that non-owner occupied properties can proceed through foreclosure as well. So there's some more latitude there. And so we are expecting somewhat of an uptick in volume over the next few months due to that. And then the CFPB rule expires January 1st. Now, as we've seen happen quite a bit during the pandemic is it could get extended or something else could take its place. But if it just ends January 1st, as, as it's scheduled to do, then that's when we would really start to see in 2022, the volume of foreclosures start to return. But we wouldn't, even with that happening, we, we are not expecting to see pre-pandemic levels of foreclosures until 2023. Hmm. Interesting. That CFPB, um, is it, is it mainly making sure that all of the loss mitigation efforts are followed like modifications and short sale? Like, is it trying to do that first? Um, Absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it. It, it's requiring lenders to offer all those options to homeowners, borrowers before proceeding with foreclosure and to, you know, go through a series of, of, of hoops to jump through to make sure that they are they're doing that um if, and that that would include even the ones who are pre-pandemic or uh, delinquencies but um those are the ones that the the ones that are were seriously delinquent after march 1st 2020 those basically the the lenders cannot start foreclosure proceedings on those at this point, unless they're vacant or abandoned. Got it. Okay. So yeah. they, no matter what, have to wait until after January 1. 
and show some efforts at loss mitigation uh, before going to that site. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, it's funny because Darren, on a much smaller scale, you know, auction.com and we are a co-op editor, co-op editors, I call them, because we have a short sale company, right? So one of our jobs is to ensure that homeowners don't get to the foreclosure aspect and we try to negotiate those beforehand. And just like auction.com, we were down to 2% <laughs> of our business for the last, you know, year and a half. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was difficult at times to keep, you know, to keep a team, right. Uh, can, can you do moving forward? But we are in my head, let me, can, if I can share my soapbox with you for a second and then get your thoughts on it. So what I've been sort of touting, and it's just, again, a rough prediction on the finance side. I was a former, you know, banker with Mellon Bank a long time ago. So we now have homeowners that are about that have, let's say they've been through a forbearance, right? So they've taken, or they didn't pay their mortgages in the last 12 to 16 months, right? It's not 16. What is it? 14? I can't do the math in my head. But either way, they haven't. Eventually they, they will have up to 18 months. Yeah. 18 months. Okay. So they have not paid their mortgage in 12 <laughs> to 18 months. And a lot of them, I'm just throwing this out there. I don't think, think they're ever going to have to pay that 12 to 18 months. So all of a sudden they get a statement right from their bank on month 19, but whenever it is, and it shows them the balance of what they now owe. And they say, well, I, I, I can't afford this. And they, they say, okay, no problem. We'll take, this is just in my head and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Bank then says, no problem. We've been authorized to do all sorts of COVID modifications. So, you know, here's your first option, pay your original mortgage payment plus $400 a month. We'll amortize it over the next five years and you're good to go. I don't even have my original income back from pre-pandemic levels. I can't do that. All right, no worries. We'll take this. We'll mod it over, you know, 30 years. And now it's only your mortgage payment plus $100 a month. They say, I can't afford my original mortgage payment. And never mind any additional. It's like, all right, no worries. We'll amortize the whole thing all over again for 30 years. And, and, and you know, we'll be done. We'll refi you with a cash out or whatever they want to do. And my soapbox says, most of those people, right? Because and this is the whole, this is my whole thought with the market prices where they are right now. The prices can only go up so high with supply and demand because ultimately incomes have to keep up, right? And incomes, what I, personally, we, you know, shut down our office space. We learn to operate more with less, right? Less people and less office space and less overhead. And that said, like, uh, you know, I don't see how incomes can possibly keep up to keep these prices. And I also don't see how these people are gonna qualify for these new modifications uh, without having to put them up for sale. And, yeah. and, and the, to finish the soapbox up, I also feel because of the inventory issues that we just talked about, the first like wave of these people that have to put them up for sale because they can't meet the lender modifications and they can't, they're gonna be fine, right? Because the, the market's stupid and everyone needs inventory. And so the first wave, they're probably gonna make money on selling those things. But my prediction is it's waves like two, three, four, and five that start to dramatically increase days on market that we finally have price declines. And the very first one, depending on the local markets, which are all different, right? The very first one in that local market that puts it out on MLS as, you know, subject to third-party approval, sold as is. Uh, you know, investors smell blood. The offers drop by about 60% because that's what mm -hmm. they do. And at that point, Mass hysteria, media has to pick up on, you know, the market has shifted and auction.com and show some mitigation. We are finally back in business. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think? What are your thoughts to my soapbox? I'm just curious. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you on several points here and I'm there and I'm trying to remember all of them, but we definitely actually, maybe this would be a good time to share a slide if, if absolutely, because I think I have one that is very pertinent here if I can find it real quick, but okay. having to do with, um, with the short sale, this, this idea of short sales, pre foreclosure sales. And yeah, we recognize <laughs> that's a big, that's really basically a big kind of competitor to what we're doing is those properties that sell pre foreclosure sale. You seen the screen there, the rising prominence of pre foreclosure sales. Yes. I yeah, love okay. these slides. So, so actually, we I just pulled this data recently for a, a 
a client meeting we had. So these are the slides from that. But we have noticed this recent spike here in the pre pre foreclosure share. This is is a share of all distressed dispositions. So if you take it as uh, foreclosure sales, REO sales, and pre foreclosure sales, which are basically short sales. Um, although to your point, a lot of them turn out to be, at least in this stupid market as you call it, <laughs> turn out to be uh, equity sales, not short sales. Yeah. Anyway, so there's a spike there, but then also if you look at it as a percentage of the total uh, retail market, you know, it's still short sale or pre foreclosure sales are still only like one one percent to two percent of the market. But there, we did see this recent bounce back uh, in just in the last couple of months. You can't really see all the months there. But, uh, and that to me, and then there's this, this next slide shows it um, a little bit differently, but you see these numbers here. If you look at this, this I believe is the May, um, no, it's April. Anyway, you see this, I mean, there were like over 10,000 nationwide of these pre-foreclosure sales. And actually many of them were short sales. And that was the highest we'd seen since going back to, to pre-pandemic, October 2019, it looks like. Mm -hmm. So that to me is an indication, maybe we're seeing the beginning of that first wave that you talked about, that some people are saying, okay, my forbearance period is either ended or coming to an end. I've ridden, I've kind of ridden, ridden the, 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 gotten the free ride as long as it, as I could. But now if I, again, like you said, if I can't, the big thing, the government and the, you know, these lenders are throwing everything at the borrowers to, to get them back performing, to get them making that payment again, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if that person has not gotten their job back or has not gotten a job that provides as much income back, then they will have to sell, I think. That's that. That's and so I think we may be seeing maybe the beginnings of that first wave of people saying, "Okay, I'm just going to sell and and take advantage of the market, um, and and uh, and walk away from this property that, that I can't afford to to make payments on anymore." Got it. And a Got lot it. of the a disproportionately high percentage of these are FHA, which is not surprising. FHA loans. Mm -hmm because those are the low down payment loans where um, people don't have as much built-in equity right away. So um, yeah, and then the other thing I resonated with was your, your income versus price appreciation. And I don't think I have that in this deck here, but basically that's something we're looking at very carefully is affordability and there was a big shift in affordability in my mind in February of this year. Prior to February, there had been about 18 months, I think, where even though prices were, home prices were going up, the monthly payment on, on a median priced home was rising at a slower pace than wages. So wages, mm. wage growth was actually going up faster than buying a home in, in essence than the cost of buying a home because of the lower interest rates. But in, starting in February, we've seen, I think now four to five months where that is reversed, where now that monthly payment on buying a home is rising at a faster pace than wages. And that was kind of inevitable. The, the pace of price appreciation, we, you know, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't expect that to last. And so um, I think that is going to start to have an effect on the market and, um, and, and, and have a downward, downward pressure on home prices because you're right, wages just are not keeping up even as much as you know, <laughs> the stimulus tried to, to supplement pe people's wages. That's, that's not going to last forever. I love that ratio. I never... You just put it way better than I, I did because I'm, I'm incomes versus, you know, I'm like debt ratios, but you just said wage, wage growth 
and and monthly payment growth, like you know, for your debt. I love that. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> oh man. So my crystal ball originally, which was less educated, which was a much less educated opinion than yours, said um, that we were going to see national signs, which means the media would acknowledge um, a distressed market starting roughly six months post the the moratorium. But I think you said you felt it was going to be longer. Do you want to elaborate on your timing, your crystal ball? So you're saying that, that like it would be out there in the, the universe that we were. Um, what's the what's we were, the market? Yeah, sorry to clarify. So like once the market, uh, the waves start to come out, equity sales, right? And then all of a sudden days on market goes longer and price declines start happening, right? And then all of a sudden, six months after, when basically it's like wave two or three start to come out, the media finally says, gee, th it looks like we're finally moving into a buyer's market and there's some investors in the water. And because the media said it, now all the investors come back out and the, the, the offers drop <laughs> to 60%. Self-fulfilling self proxy, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I guess I'm looking at it through a slightly different lens than that, which is just like, when are we going to return to the levels we were seeing back in 2019 even, which 2019 was in the history of, of the foreclosure market was a very low year. But anyway, we, yeah, we're not, in our, we actually have a forecast that goes out for five years and we're not expecting the numbers to return to the 2019 levels until 2023. Now, there will, we are expecting a ramp up in 2022 and near the end of the second half of 2022, we will be kind of approaching those pre-pandemic levels. So maybe I'm not as far off as, as, as you think, if you look at it that way. Yeah. And at some point, I mean, in some ways the media loves to talk about, um, talk, you know, if they, they didn't, they love to talk about the bad news. If it leads it, if it bleeds, it leads. That's it. Blood of the but, streets. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But the the thing is that um, the government agencies and the lenders, especially the big banks, who are and and I was like I said, I think it was just uh, last week. I was meeting with um, several of our clients, some of whom are big banks, some of who are. Service, loan servicers, they're very, especially the, the big banks and the government agencies, they're very averse to that. What they call, they actually call it headline risk. They do not want to see that headline that foreclosures are spiking. Because mm. um, then all of a sudden they become the bad guy. So <laughs> they're doing as much as they can to prevent those headlines that you're talking about. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there's the problem is the longer that the longer that you hold back, the bigger that the problem becomes, right? So I think they kind of realize that to a certain extent too. So the, the ideal scenario from their perspective is to kind of gradually open up the floodgates so things don't become overwhelming too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, I love this, Darren. <laughs> <laughs> I can't thank you enough. Is um, I, I know we're almost at our time today, but is there any what uh, anything else you want to share from what you're seeing, or would you encourage people to do do anything, or like what what's your what's any final parting words for people for folks? Yeah, I mean, I I think that the parting words are that I, I was actually just thinking about this this morning is that. Um, This is not like 2000. A lot of people like to try to compare what we're going through now to 2008, and it's not like it. However, the market is still cyclical, I believe. Um, and so I think that we need to, you know, people need to realize that the way the market is now, despite all the, all the headlines are seen and all of the, um, yeah, the headlines about how the housing market is amazing and and all of that is that there it will not always be that way. <laughs> Things change. <laughs> and there and maybe this is a repeat of what we said in October 2019. 
I'm hoping there's not another big catalyst, but um, the market does operate in cycles and, and uh, from everything I've seen, and that, the cycles are not as dramatic as, as 2008, but we've also been tinkering with the normal market cycle this past, more than tinkering, we've been overhauling uh, how the market cycle behaved over this last 18 months. And that could have some re re repercussions over the longer term, I think, that investors should be looking out for. I love this. Darren, thank you so much. Uh, to all the listeners and watchers out there, be sure to get a profile set up on auction.com. Uh, you can set up filters to have things automatically emailed to you when something meets your geo uh, criteria. Um, it's absolutely one of our deal sources. Um, especially when there's, there's inventory, which is coming. As Darren <laughs> said, uh, there's a lot more inventory coming out on that as we see the end of what, you know, the government incentives, the government prop ups, the forbearances, the stimulus checks, like all of that was led to help people and it did. But as, as you said, the, I mean, economy is the economy. So people will, this is just what happens in a cycle. And we have to be ready for what's about to happen. And the longer that this is delayed, I, I do agree. I mean, the, the worse I think we're going to see this. Um, it, worse I, is a, Sorry, can I make one pitch for auction.com in terms of inventory? And I don't know if you know about this, but uh, we, in the last, actually, I mean, it's been the last nine months or so, but we've been slowly, slowly launching what we call remote bid, where with the foreclosure auctions, you can bid remotely from your mobile phone. And so that is our attempt. So the foreclosure auctions typically, and I don't know if you, if you do mostly foreclosure auctions or the bank owned auctions, which are online, but mm -hmm. one of the big um, impediments to the foreclosure auction is typically you have to be there in person or have someone there at the courthouse in person bidding for you. Yeah. And so with this remote bid, we're trying to overcome that. It's not available everywhere, but it's available in almost a thousand counties now across the country. And so basically that, that opens up some inventory for you. So instead of just bidding on the places where you can drive to the auctions, um, you can now bid on properties in, and it's, it's still a live auction. So you're participating in a live auction along with the people in the room, but just through your mobile device. So that's just one, one technology piece we've done to try to uh, help with the inventory issue. That's so cool. Is it, did you have to get those counties as clients or is it, no, is it a whole service that's separate from that? It, there's a lot of complexity that goes into it. I mean, yeah. the, the counties themselves are not clients and we're, and, Right now, it's mostly in non-judicial states where the sheriffs are not conducting the sale because that's a whole other level yeah. of cooperation from the sheriffs. It's now, you know, the it's mostly in non-judicial states where there's a trustee who's handling uh, the sale, which, um, you know, we actually act as a trustee in those situations. And so then we can control that, but we have to get we have to get a lot of stakeholders to cooperate. So it's, it's, it's a pretty Herculean task that our uh, product and technology teams have, have worked through to, to even get those 1000 counties online. So super cool. Hey, Darren, can we have you back in whether it's six or nine or 12 months, depending? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. And uh, that'd be great. You know, maybe, maybe in 20, it's, it's crazy that it's going to be 2022 pretty soon. <laughs> it yeah. is indeed. It is indeed. I, I will, I mean, the more you come on the show, we appreciate this so much. Uh, this is the man behind the numbers and he has literally his fingers and head around the pulse of what's happening. Pre foreclosure and foreclosure. Um, Darren, thank you for your time today, man. Really appreciate awesome. it. Great to be here, Nick. Thank you so much. <laughs> Folks. Thank you so much for taking part in another episode of the shut up and do it podcast where we bring as much value as we can by sharing top quality guests and speakers, all who believe in a shut up and do it manner. Huge thank you today to Darren Blomquist of auction.com, VP of economics. 
Um, please be and check us out in six to nine to 12 months. We're going to do it again and keep our pulse on what's going on. Be sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to get notified of when we release these podcasts. We release them every other Thursday at one o'clock uh, Eastern and head on over to shut up and do it real estate.com for all the episodes. And if you're local to the Boston market, be sure to take part in our newly launched REI Unleashed Meetup. It's going to be the third Tuesday night of every month. Uh, definitely go to the New England REI Unleashed Facebook group to check out events. Uh, we'd love to see that we're becoming the number one resource for intermediate content, as well as deal exchanging, referrals, and just high quality networking. So until next time, thanks for checking us out and we'll see you there.